same truth they sing about, and that same Jesus is the same one that I know. And He's always been the same. Isn't that wonderful that we serve an unchanging God? You can know the truth now, and if you know it now, you can know it the rest of your life. Please open your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. And if you need a Bible, uh, or if you find it in the black Bibles around you, I think it's a page of thousand something. Uh, Make sure everybody has a copy of the scripture. 1038 in this Bible. There you go, Malachi. There's a Bible for you, sir. Work out some arms. <coughs> you see somebody looking, fumbling to find their place in the scripture, feel free to help them. And uh, if you see someone without a copy of the scripture looking around desperately, then uh, feel free. Now, your Bible's different. Uh, your Bible's different than theirs. It, it has it. Has, let, me, let me look it up for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Feel free to grab a Bible for somebody, help them find their place, and slip it back to them. Make it so everybody has a copy of the Scripture. Let me share with you some things that are going on in the ministry of Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. And a lot of times, you know, I think, you know, I think the folks that come on Sunday mornings maybe just don't know a lot about the ministry, a lot about what happens. Uh, you know, we joke a lot. I have a friend that always calls me and asks me if I'm working, and he says, "Oh yeah, I forgot. It's not Sunday." You know, it's uh, you know your your work day, your one day of the week that you work, and I think it's funny. I actually, <laughs> it's it's kind of not funny because I actually knew pastors that really they they did a Sunday morning service and that was like their thing for the week. And uh, we we have more going on in our ministry than Sunday morning. Actually, right. Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church has three churches uh, that meet on Sundays. We have uh, Marathon Baptist Church in Key Marathon, where Pastor Nick Wielander is uh, preaching this morning and then we this afternoon we'll be in Miami Beach Baptist Church at our church plant down there and we're praying and if you'll pray with us for it we're praying that God will give us a full-time pastor for Miami Beach Baptist Church and we believe that in May David Vilsus young man that's preparing for the ministry in Bible College will come and uh, he'll be able to step gradually into that into that position there are also some other folks that uh, God is maybe leading to be part of that ministry but that's something that's going on, and uh, you would be invited. It's a ministry of Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. Sometimes, you know, churches support a lot of different ministries. We start churches. That's what we do. We started this church, started Marathon Baptist Church, and uh, we have that ministry down there. We also hold services there on Thursday nights, Wednesday night service here. And then another ministry that we have in our churches is our youth ministry. Every Saturday, every Saturday evening, almost without exception, we do have teen activity at 5.30. Last night we had, I think, 17 teenagers, about the same the week before. The week before that, I think we had something like 25 or 30 teenagers. We had three teens trust Jesus as their Savior yesterday evening. And that wouldn't be unusual on a, on a Saturday night. We have a vibrant, growing youth group. And you may have noticed we're starting to have quite a few teens in our teen Sunday school class and in our church service as well in this ministry. And so we're burdened for them. And uh, if you pray about that, and if you want to serve, you want to be involved, you say, Pastor, what are some things going on I can be involved in? Man, we sure could use some helpers and some workers. And so I want to let you know about that. Also something that I'm working on right now is uh, just a disaster response effort. Uh, when the hurricane happened, when Hurricane Irma happened a few uh, weeks ago, almost a month ago now, it is a month ago, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, when Hurricane Irma hit struck, one of the things I was burdened about was being able to use the opportunity that a storm creates to disrupt people's lives for an opportunity for ministry. And I've had actually a lot of pastors from different parts of the country call me and say, hey, Brother Price, what are you doing to reach out to people uh, that have been part of the storm disaster? Now, we have been as a church down to the Florida Keys, where the disaster is the worst. Man, if you go to Big Pine Key, I think it's something like six out of ten homes are destroyed in Big Pine Key. It's really bad. Key Marathon, where our church is at, is pretty bad, but the church facilities made out pretty well there. We have really been praying and looking for a way that we could do ministry as an opportunity from the storm. So we, uh, some ministries sent in truckloads of food, like 353-foot uh, semi-box truckloads of food and uh, different groups have come in and given a lot of that out. But one of the things we found when we were distributing the food was that while it was appreciated, it was not greatly needed. In other words, the government's giving out food, the Red Cross is giving out food, all kinds of ministries are giving out food, 
and uh, nobody's starving in the Keys. Matter of fact, a lot of people actually said, no, thank you, when we're bringing, you know, just trying to distribute food, you know, good stuff. We're just, oh, no thanks, don't need it. Um, so, so pastors have asked, well, what, what is the need in the Florida Keys? Well, for a lot of people, the physical need is actually housing. When we were doing uh, distribution, uh, Mrs. Price told me about the neighborhood she went into. She said, people are living there in homes with no roof. I mean, as in daylight, skylight, you know, that's your house. Literally, they live in the kind of houses that were not built to, to really for the keys, and the roofs are gone, completely gone, and they're living there. So they could use a home, those folks could. Uh, and the reality of it, though, is if I were in the position to, to distribute homes to people, the infrastructure requirements, the things like just the legal act, aspect of putting a FEMA trailer or a RV or something like that in places. It's not feasible. You can't just go give out houses because they're not allowed to just put houses there, you know, or there's not room for whatever. It's logistically, it's not possible. And by the way, FEMA's doing that. FEMA's giving out housing and it'll, it'll be happening. And it's very difficult to compete with the government when it comes to what you can give away at taxpayers' expense. We don't have taxpayers in our church. And so that really isn't, that's the major need. It's not something we can do. If I were to take a million dollars in $100 bills and go to the Florida Keys, I'm certain that I could pass out $100 bills and people would take it from me because who's going to turn down a $100 bill? But the reality of it is, is that the class of people the, who's really primarily the working class who have been displaced actually have a lot of work right now. There's an economic boom in the Florida Keys, and so they're making good money, actually. So I could give out $100 bills, but it's not what's needed. The people actually have an income. So they have food, and they have an income. So then what's left for a church to do when you have a heart to help people that have been had their lives disrupted? Well, I think that's when you kind of get real and realize what a church is. See, we are not an organization that is developed for the purpose of passing out food, passing out cash, or building people houses. Those things can be things we can do as outreach and for ministry. But if there's one thing that a church ought to do and be good at, it ought to be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you agree with that? In other words, if there's something that a church ought to do, a church, you know, because of some confusion uh, with what people think a church is, see, a, ch a believer is to be charitable. The word charity means love particularly love for brethren. And love does, doesn't it? And so because Christians are charitable, that is, they give, oftentimes people are confused about the purpose of a church. They think a church's job or purpose is to give out money, to give out food, to give out stuff. And actually that isn't what our purpose is. Our purpose is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever He commanded you. And though I'm with you always, even at the end of the world. So I've been praying for wisdom from the Lord and seeking counsel from people that I've talked to about what could we do to get out the gospel or do what a church does. And so the Lord's led us. We're uh, in the process. I'm in the process of writing a pamphlet uh, entitled, Where is God in the Storm? Where is God in the Storm? And asking the question, you know, really some hard questions for a lot of people. In other words, my life has been disrupted. Who did it? Who disrupted my life? Well, God did, didn't He? Well, then what is God doing? You know, for many of us, the way we feel for the most part in Fort Lauderdale is we were spared during the storm, weren't we? Don't you feel that way? I feel like I was spared in the storm. Why was I spared in the storm? That's a good question to answer, isn't it? And then if I were spared and others were not, why was I spared and others were not spared in the storm? And friend, I don't think it is that I'm a good person and they're bad. But I think God is working, don't you? And God is working in the storm. And so pray for us. Pray for me to have wisdom as we write and we do the printing and we do some outreach. And we'll be mentioning to you probably the need to take a crew of people to go down and just try to put a pamphlet on every house in the Florida Keys. 
And so I have some things that you can do in the near future. It's something we're praying about, something we're working on. And Charlie's excited about it, even though this is probably the first time he heard about it. Is that the first time you heard about it, Charlie? Yeah, he's, he's up here grinning like, yay, this sounds fun. Uh, so those are some things that I would covet your prayers and your involvement in. As well, if you had some thoughts, not about something different to do because we're, we're already committed to do what we're doing, but if you had some thoughts about some questions or some things that need to be answered in that pamphlet, if you'd share those with me, that would be a real help for me. Uh, so I'd appreciate your help with that. Matthew chapter 3, have you found it? If you're in Matthew chapter 3, will you please look down to verse 13, and we'll read our text this morning. After reading our text, then we'll pray. The Bible says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Look down to verse 1 of chapter 4. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward in hunger. And when the tempter came to him and said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get behind me, Satan, or get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Could we agree before we pray this morning that this is an interesting passage? There's a lot here, isn't there? Very interesting. And truthfully, there are so many topics that you could draw out of the overall context that we could spend some time here. And we will not be dealing so much topically as we will with the overview of what's happened here this morning. If you have some questions about the text and you'd like to ask those questions after the service or this week, uh, my email, my phone number are on the church bulletins. I'm easily uh, able to be reached, so feel free to call or email me if you have questions, or feel free to ask me after the service or whatever. So don't think this morning that I don't want to answer all the questions, but there just is not time uh, this morning or this afternoon or today to deal with everything that's in the text. So let's pray. We'll ask the Lord to help us with what we're going to deal with, shall we? Father, we do, we do covet your help here this morning with understanding. Lord, the, the worst thing that could happen this morning would be for us, first of all, to misapply the Scripture. So... Help, help there not to be anything extra biblical that we discussed today. Then, God, I just ask that you would help us to go from intellectual to literally personal and heart's application for the Scripture. Help us not to just know things in our head, but help us to know them in our hearts and for it to affect us and change us to be more like Jesus as a result. We do ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So, we've been looking at the last several weeks, we looked at the ministry of John the Baptist. Uh, we have been in Matthew chapter 3, actually, a pr pretty good amount of time and looking at some important doctrinal truths. Today, though, we're going to look at what John chapter, or Matthew, I keep saying John, what Matthew chapter 3 leads us up to and that is that Jesus came to John the Baptist to be baptized of him. Uh, if you were to read in other scriptural accounts, when John, or, or you read later on about John the Baptist and his ministry, John the Baptist was the most popular prophet in Israel in his day. Uh, that's not understated. 
or that's not overstated, it's understated. The reality of it is, is that literally multitudes went out in the wilderness to hear John the Baptist's message. And John the Baptist's message was repent for the day of Christ is at hand. That's it. That was his message. It was a message about Jesus. And then secondarily, when the Pharisees and Sadducees came out to John the Baptist to be baptized of him, his message was, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he said, I indeed baptize you with water, but the one is going to come, Christ is going to come, and he's going to baptize with fire. And then he talked about he's the one who's going to go into the threshing floor, and he's going to take the threshing uh, fan or the fork, and he's going to throw the, thre the chaff up. The grain's going to be dropped on the ground, but the chaff's going to blow off, and then he's going to burn the chaff with fire. And what he's saying is, hey, if you're here and you're a fake, you're here and you're a phony, Jesus knows it. And he's going to burn the fakes and he's going to burn the phonies. In other words, these would be the religious folks. And uh, Jesus, or John, explained repentance and the importance of repentance. And so that was, I believe, last week's message. Uh, and you could, you, it should be online hopefully soon. It's, I don't think it is yet, but you could catch up on it. I can't cover that today. But today, I want to look at one of the most amazing aspects of Christ's uh, ministry in a clear account of Scripture. In other words, this is not something that I think was an amazing aspect of Jesus' ministry. This is something that the Bible expressly states about Jesus and about His ministry. And that is the truth that He was indwelt by God's Holy Spirit. Now on the surface, those are words. On the surface, it's a concept. And on the surface, that's not such a big deal unless you consider who Jesus was. Who was Jesus? He was the Son of God. Who was Jesus? He's God in the flesh. He was God. Okay, now when you tell me then that God in the flesh had God's Spirit descend on Him, then that ought to make me say, huh? Because the reality of it is, is that that's kind of a big deal. This kind of amazing. Matter of fact, to me it's surprising. Now, how many of us need God's Spirit? We all do, right? Okay. Did Jesus need God's Spirit? See, that's a trick question, isn't it? You're like, ah, oh, Pastor, I don't know. Okay. Did Jesus need God's Spirit for Himself? Who is Jesus? Yeah. Jesus is God, right? Uh, I love John chapter 3 and verse 13. If you want an interesting personal study, and by the way, one of the reasons that we would use the copy of the Scripture that we do is because of the way John 3.13 is accurately rendered where the Scripture actually teaches about Jesus. No man hath ascended into heaven, but the Son of Man uh, which has come down from heaven. Let me, let me read it to you because I'm about to misquote it. And you don't need to turn there uh, unless you just don't believe me if, that I'm going to read it accurately. Then you could turn there. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, notice this, which is in heaven. So Jesus is on earth talking to Nicodemus and on earth speaking face to face just like I would be with Tilly here. So uh, Jesus is speaking face to face with Nicodemus and face to face He said, No man's been to heaven but the Son of Man. He's talking about Himself, the Son of Man, which has come down from heaven. So nobody's ever been to heaven. You've never met somebody that's been to heaven. I am fed up with the nonsense about people claiming that they had an out-of-body experience, went to heaven, talked to Jesus, and all this nonsense. It's a lie. Jesus said no man's been to heaven. Okay, and that's true. There's no person on this earth who's been to heaven. Now, they may have had too much pizza and ice cream in combination, or they may have got knocked out of their mind and had a wacky dream and thought that they saw something, but Jesus said nobody's been to heaven. And I believe Jesus. A couple of years ago, you remember the story about Colton Burpo, the kid, that uh, little boy that supposedly died, went to heaven, and he told all this nonsense. It was all made up. And I believe it was exposed as all made up. But a lot of Christians were just like, oh, wow, well, you've got to read this, you know, about what he said about heaven. And, you know, and major doctrinal studies done. It was, the kid didn't go to heaven. Jesus said so. You got it? Okay. All right, I didn't use Granger's logo. Get it, got it, good. Tried hard not to, okay? Okay. Um, 
Okay, you got it. Je Colton Burpo didn't go to heaven. Jesus said no man's been to heaven. But then he said, but the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Where am I at? Right here. Okay, if I were Jesus, if, if I'm me and I say, no one's in heaven except for me, I'm in heaven. You'd be like, I'm in the same place you are. <laughs> and this is not heaven. I always feel like telling that to Jehovah's Witnesses. I try not to be sarcastic or mean when you're talking to people, but I just want to tell them, if this is God's kingdom, we need a better God. This just isn't doing it. This is a mess, right? Now, there's some great things in this life, but it's only because of God. And it's in spite of the evil that's in this world. This is, this is not heaven, is it, Tilly? No. So Jesus said, nobody's been to heaven except for me. I came from heaven. And He said, I'm in heaven. And in that verse, He's referring to what? The fact that He's God. And that God is in heaven and He is an equal part of God is in heaven He's in earth. It's His omnipresence that He's teaching. So Jesus, when He was bodily in the flesh, was still God and He still was in heaven. And I love that because that, that portion of Scripture is teaching a lot of important doctrines, just the way it's stated. No one's been to heaven except for the Son of Man, which is in heaven, present tense, when He was speaking to Nicodemus. And that's not the message for today. But that's an aside. That's something to introduce us. I want us to understand that Jesus was God. Jesus was had all the attributes and characteristics of God, including omniscience and omnipresence. Cool, huh? All right, that's cool. But it doesn't answer the question that I asked earlier. Why did Jesus need to be empowered or indwelt or filled by or have the uh, the Holy Spirit of God descend on him? There's actually a really good Bible answer here, and you wouldn't believe how practical it is if you've never, if it's never occurred to you before. Now, if you've heard me preach on it before, or if you studied it yourself and found this true, you'd realize it. But I'm just telling you something. This passage of Scripture holds and unlocks a key biblical understanding of something that's true, whether you realize it or not, but something that is so true that actually it could be a game changer for you this week. That's neat, isn't it? Okay, now here we are. Look at uh, verse uh, 13. It's cold up here in the front, and that's the coldest seat, in case you guys didn't know it. Uh, <laughs> this, this vent and this vent here are double teaming that chair right there. So if you're one of those people, if you're one of those people that are perpetually hot and you're wishing it were cooler, and you're not one of these people that bring a blanket to church, by the way, feel free to bring blankets to church uh, if you need to. It won't bother anybody. Uh, but if you're if you're hot right there, that's that's the cool seat in town. All right now, <laughs> so the Bible says about John the Baptist. We know the dialogue, right? We've talked about John said to Jesus, "I have need to be baptized of thee." And John, Jesus said to John, "Suffer." The word "suffer" means allow. It's an old English word. It means suffer it or allow it to be so for now. For thus becometh the will of the Father. Jesus said to John the Baptist in terms we would understand. Please do this because it's what God wants. Okay? So he's not trying to explain everything to John. He's trying to explain to John, you know, God wants this, so please do it. Well, when you say God wants something and it's God's Son that's saying it to you, he's saying God the Father wants this and God the Son saying it. Okay, let's do it. I'll baptize you. I would not have felt worthy to baptize Jesus either. I wouldn't feel worthy to talk to Jesus. You know, I mean, when it comes to worth or worthiness, you know, that's why Jesus came is because of my unworthiness. Okay, so John baptizes Jesus. And then the Bible talks about when he came up out of the water, that uh, the, straight when he was baptized, he went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. <coughs> and this is Matthew's testimony that this happened. Matthew said, I saw heaven open like... God's heaven, not like the heavens. The heavens, God's Spirit bodily, physically came down and lighted or landed on Jesus. Now, a lot of people, you know, a lot of Christian bookstores, right, sell little dove symbols and they use a dove as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's just, it's not, um, well, let me explain doves to you from my perspective. This will help you and ruin forever in your mind what a dove is. Okay, when I'm out dove hunting, and if you're hunting with a dog, or if you're just out walking in the fields, you hear a kind of like quail have a particular sound. The fluttering sound, you know the sound the doves make? And the, 
you know, they make the noise. Well, they, they, when they fly, their wings make a particular noise, and I blow them out of the sky. Okay, and uh, that's doves to me. So <laughs> that'll probably forever ruin the picture. But the idea is the way a dove lands. You know how doves... They land differently than other birds, the way that their wings fly. Don't cry, Kelly. <laughs> Okay, the, the way that uh, doves land, I don't shoot them on the ground, I shoot them in the air. And they do land differently when I shoot them. Okay, so anyway, when a dove lands, it makes a different sound than uh, other birds do. And that's the idea, of the, just the way that it descended. It's not the, you know, the Holy Spirit of God looks like a bird that I shoot. No, the Holy Spirit of God landed like a dove on Jesus. It lighted on just like a bird that would come down. And that was that kind of a presence, and that probably that kind of a speed, and that it was the motion, it was the manner, not the looks. Get that? Okay. So the Bible says that God's spirit, and then a voice from heaven. Whose voice do you suppose came from heaven? God's. God's. God the Father's voice. And He said, "This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased." Beloved, loved by the Father, pleasing. A son who is beloved, well beloved, is a son who both pleases the Father and whom, I mean, He literally is the apple of His Father's eye. In other words, this is my precious Son. This is my lovely Son. This is my perfect Son. This is my beloved Son. I'm pleased by my Son. What pleased God the Father? Well, in this instance, the fact that He and John the Baptist submitted to His baptism. What does baptism in the New Testament picture? The death, the burial, and the resurrection, actually. And so when Jesus was baptized, He actually was identifying, the same way when you get baptized, He was identifying with His own death, burial, and resurrection. In other words, His baptism and His surrender to the will of the Father was actually more than just symbolic. It literally was, I have come to perform or accomplish the Father's purpose. His baptism was obedience every bit as much as mine is or yours is. And in getting baptized, he identified with his own death, burial, and resurrection, and it pleased God. And then God's Spirit descended on him, and we see from the moment that God's Spirit is on him, this is when Jesus' ministry begins. I find the ministry of the Lord Jesus beginning before God's Spirit comes on him. That's an interesting thing to note, isn't it? All the Gospels give the same account, the same reasons. We know that Jesus, when we were, remember a few, uh, a couple of months ago, we were in our series on uh, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, and we talked about two statements that Jesus made about the ministry of the Spirit that seemed like things we wouldn't agree with. Remember when He said, greater things than these shall ye do? In other words, the works that I do, He said, greater things than these shall ye do because I go unto my Father. And I think I wouldn't agree with that except Jesus said it. And then when I examine it carefully, I know it's so. How can we do greater things than Jesus? Well, because of the work of the Gospel, preaching the Gospel. And uh, greater in God's mind than supernatural miracles is for the Gospel to be preached and for people to turn to Jesus. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we looked at some other things about God's Spirit, some notable truths about God's Holy Spirit. The other thing that we said was, was unique about the ministry of God's Spirit was that Jesus said, it is expedient for you that I go away. And we would think if Jesus were bodily present with us, if He said, it's better for you that I'm not here, we'd say, no, Jesus, it's better for me that you are here. Right? But He said, if I go not away, the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, will not come unto you. So literally, Jesus said having the ministry of the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, is better than my own ministry. Now, I want to make, I, I, honestly, the message this morning, I'm getting into it, it's not that long, but the point of John chapter 3, verses 13 through John chapter 4 in the account of Jesus going into the wilderness in His ministry beginning and the temptation of Christ in the wilderness, the point of it, my friend, is that when Jesus worked on this earth when He did His ministry, He did not minister without the power of God's Spirit first. And secondly, everything Jesus did in His ministry can be followed by us. We literally are physically able to follow His model or His example because we can have the same power that He had. This is an important truth, and it, 
you know what, just the way I stated it, it almost seems like, man, you've got to say it better than that because it's such a big deal. It is a big deal that you and I can follow the example of Jesus Christ, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you, in my flesh, with my ability for me to be like Jesus, I, I don't mind, I, I miss the WWJD bracelets. How many of you guys are old enough? The WWJD bracelets. And I know that supposedly the Mormons made a lot of money off of those things, but the concept behind them I've never been in disagreement with. Have you? What would Jesus do is a great question to ask. Isn't it? Sheldon, it was a Sheldon Smith's uh, book in his steps that it kind of got its took its uh, take from. Anyway, Charles. the point is, Charles, Charles Sheldon, whatever. Yeah, I know who Sheldon Smith is. <laughs> <None>. <laughs> yeah, exactly. he's the editor of the sword board. Uh, uh, Charles Sheldon. So, and what would Jesus do was his motto, and people started asking before they did anything, what would Jesus do? How would Jesus run my business? What would Jesus do in the home? And it changed the whole a bunch of people because they asked the question, what would Jesus do? The fact of the matter is that the question, what would Jesus do, doesn't change anybody. It's the power of the Spirit in the life of, of a believer that changes people. It's actually the truth. Now, I'm not, I'm not bashing the WWJD bracelets. Like I said, I kind of miss them. You know, I was like, everybody had one. They didn't know who Jesus was. And they're wearing a WWJD bracelet because they were cooler than ZO2s in the day. Now, my point would be that if you missed that, don't worry, you didn't miss anything. If you don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, okay. so I want to just point out a couple of things this morning. First of all, we see in our text, one of the first things we saw, it's important to point out the uniqueness of God. Uh, and we talked about the fact that Jesus is the only one who's able to be on earth and in heaven, right? The Son of Man which is in heaven. So we saw the doctrine of the Godhead of the Trinity. But what's amazing to me is that God's Spirit actually came on Jesus. Because I personally, I asked the question, why did Jesus need God's Spirit? Well, truthfully, Himself, He didn't need God's Spirit. If you read about who Jesus is and His power as God, you'll realize that Jesus is not limited in physical power. When Jesus was on the cross, He expressly stated, He said, I lay my life down. No man taketh it from me. You are not killing me on the cross. I am allowing myself to be a sacrifice on the cross. In other words, Jesus did not resist. He literally could have called 10,000 angels. It's not just a great song. He literally could have called a legion from heaven and they would have absolutely destroyed anybody around. One angel could have done the job, the task actually, that Jesus needed done. So Jesus' life was not taken from Him. He was not a helpless Savior. He was a willing Savior, and there's a big difference, isn't it? Isn't it true? So Jesus had all the power in Him as God. When you read in Proverbs, who hath made the winds? Who hath, uh, to, uh, 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 let's see, put the, bound the waters in a garment? And the Scripture says, what is His name and what is His Son's name if thou canst tell? You read in, Gen in Genesis, the Bible says in the beginning, Elohim, that is God's singular plural, God, one God, plural, in person. Elohim, Im means plural. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit created the heaven and the earth. And Jesus, as we study the Bible and we look at the creation, He was actually the part of the Godhead who spoke the world into existence. Jesus, my friend, is not a weakling. He is not someone who needs a defender or needs a leader or needs a helper. Do you understand that? In other words, God's Spirit did not descend on Jesus because He was lost in the world. He came to the world in obedience to the will of His Father. But my friend, Jesus was not needy Himself. But here we see in the Scripture that Jesus needed to have the power of the Holy Spirit because He laid down His power as God to become a man. In other words, it wasn't that He couldn't take the power back up. It wasn't that He was any less God. It wasn't that He was no longer omnipresent. It was because Jesus literally, willingly, willfully limited Himself to just be a man. To just be limited like a man. And in so doing, Jesus modeled the example of being able to live in flesh without sin. 
Now, that's pretty big, isn't it? You know, a lot of Christians want to get themselves a list. They want to find out what the Bible says is good and what the Bible says is bad. And they want to stop doing the bad stuff and start doing the good stuff. Try it sometime. One, you'll never be able to get enough paper to make your list. Two, you'll find out that you just can't. You just can't. You're just not good enough. You live in a body of sin, a body of flesh. Hey, listen, you're eternal. Your body's not. Your body is flesh. And my friend, I'll just tell you, you ain't enough to whoop yourself into shape without God's help. And so here Jesus is laying down His authority as God. Could Jesus stand up to the devil? Read Revelation sometime. He is going to speak the destruction of the wicked, and Jesus literally is just going to say, tie him up. With the words of His mouth, Jesus is more powerful than the Satan. And so the temptation where Jesus is led into the wilderness is not because He personally is weak, it is because He has laid aside His power as God to please the Father. And in so doing, now herein He models the Spirit-filled life. What it means to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. Now let me ask you a question. If it was important for Jesus to have God's Spirit, how important is it for us? Could we say equally? In other words, if God the Son needed the ministry of God the Holy Spirit to carry out His earthly ministry to fulfill the will of God the Father, if God the Son needed that, how much do I need the same? A lot? As much? More? Words fail us, don't they? To describe how much I need God's Spirit's power in my life. Don't they? I mean, I just can't exaggerate it enough. I can't say, if God, then I. Because we're so different. So then we see the account of God's Son being led after His baptism immediately. The Bible says in chapter 4 and verse 1, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when He had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, He was afterward in hunger. You have probably never been to the point of weakness that Jesus was after fasting for 40 days. Now, let me just ask the question, has anyone ever here, this is not to glorify man or anything, I'm just curious. Has anyone here ever fasted for 40 days? Okay, what's the longest that somebody here has fasted? I've gone like maybe four weeks without eating before. How, what's the longest somebody here has fasted? Anybody done a month? Done a full month of fasting before? Like a, week. a week? You've gone a week without eating before? It gets easy after like the third day. A week's not too bad, is it? Two days. Two days? You've gone two days without eating? The hardest day is the first day, isn't it, for fasting for yeah. most people? Toughest day is the the first day. There are stages in fasting, and I don't want to have a series on fasting here this morning or talk about it or glorify any man's flesh. Anybody can stop eating, and it's not, you know, there's nothing really complicated about it. Actually, some things are kind of dangerous about it if you uh, don't know what you're doing and if you're doing it for the wrong reasons or what. It could be very, very deadly. Just okay. drink the water. In fact, most people die when they don't eat. Just drink water. Okay. Yeah, just drinking nothing but water. Okay, so we're talking about it. But Jesus fasted for 40 days. Could we say then that because none of us here have fasted for 40 days and Jesus had, that Jesus actually physically was at a point of weakness that we've never reached? That's the point, isn't it? Of the past scripture. It isn't, you know, 40, there's nothing magical about 40 days of fasting. Okay, you're down. Don't get up again, mister. Got it? Thank you. All right. Uh, for 40 days, Jesus fasted. And the point isn't that there's something about 40 days. The point is Jesus was at a place of bodily, physical weakness, wasn't He? It's tough. Hard thing that He did. I, I'm not asking you. I, I don't think you should try it, okay? And this is when we see that He is tempted of the devil. He fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. And then the tempter came to Him. The first, the first attack was, you're not the Son of God. The first test for Jesus was to literally reject the work of the Spirit in his life and to take up his own strength. If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made into bread. If you're God, was the first question. Now, was Jesus God? 
He said so. God said so. Uh, there's no validity to if you're God except for there is the appeal or there is the challenge to disobey the Father, not do what, what the Father has, caused, has called you to do. If you're God, command these stones be made to bread. You know, and Jesus said, it's written, thou shalt not tempt, uh, or a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus literally said, I'm not going to disobey the Father and take up my, my power as God in order to sustain myself. You know, you can't command stones to be made to bread, can you? When you're hungry. And if you think about it, if Jesus had commanded the stones to be made bread, He would not have limited Himself in the likeness of human flesh. Do you get it? He would not have been an example for us, but here we find Jesus is our example. His example is, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I need God, not bread. God give us believers that with the help of the Holy Spirit realize that their need is not bread. Their need is God and God's Word. Number two, second thing that we see that happens here is that the devil in verse 5 taketh him into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. So this is Jerusalem. And he saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee, lest any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And here we find that uh, Jesus, God's Word, deals with a misapplication of the Scripture. In other words, the Bible doesn't say, you know, throw yourself off a temple and God will save you. Throw yourself off of a wall. The Bible says that God has given His angels charge over us, so, lest any time that He would cast your foot against a stone. In other words, God protects us. But God's protection for us does not mean that God wants us to do stupid things and He'll stop us from being hurt. So don't play with snakes, okay? Uh, you know, there are churches that, you know, take the, uh, the last couple verses out of Mark and you can show, take up a poisonous serpent and, you know, I won't harm him and that sort of nonsense. So they're, they're literally, you probably don't even know this, but there are churches in Tennessee, and of course there are all kinds of things in Tennessee that there aren't normal places, but there are churches in Tennessee where they, they handle venomous snakes and ever so occasionally they make the news. And so... Uh, because they're misapplying the, the, the Scripture the same way the devil tried to get Jesus to misapply the Scripture here. He tried to get Jesus to set aside or, or to, to literally make God protect or provide for Him without it, there being a reason for it or misapply the Scripture. You see that? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't work that well. I don't have time... Uh, to stutter through it and try to make it sound better. So you'll just have to word it yourself and do better than I did. Okay, in, in verse 7, Jesus' answer was, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And then the, the, we see in verse 8, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto them, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship thee. Now this one always has confused me. Has, has it been one that was confusing to you? How is the devil going to give Jesus the kingdoms of the world? Well, the Bible teaches that the devil is the prince of the power of the air, but I just want to tell you something. This world does not belong to the devil, and it never has. It's, it's corrupt. It's sinful. It's passing away just like the devil is, but it's not his. You know, some people think that they can give their soul to the devil or that they can uh, give themselves to the devil. You can't. The devil's not God. Actually, you can make a, de a contract with Satan, and guess what? You can break it too. Because he's not God. He's just a being that's created by God, the same as you and I are. Not the same as you and I are. He's an angelic being. We're a human being. But we're made in God's image. The devil doesn't own the kingdoms of the world. So what was he offering Jesus here? What's that? Well, one is a lie. Well, yeah, here's the deal. Would the devil, if Jesus were to bow down and worship the devil... Would the devil then keep his word? He's a liar and the father of it, so we know he's lying. Okay, so that could be one plausible answer, but I believe that the answer that's understood even from a careful study of the text with the help of the Holy Spirit is simply this. The devil is offering to withdraw his influence on the kingdoms of the world. He's saying, I'll let you have them. You can go and influence the kingdoms of the world without me. Now, I just want to tell you something. First of all, the world's wicked without the devil. The world's wicked without the devil. Do you realize that? 
In other words, I don't buy into the whole devil made me do it line, do you? God doesn't excuse us. God doesn't say, well, it isn't their fault. The devil made them do it. The devil doesn't make anybody do anything. Why do we sin? The Bible says every man sins when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So why do I sin? Because of the lust of my flesh. I sin because I want to. And so do you. Just so that we can be clear about things. So when the devil is saying he'll withdraw himself, the first logical answer to that is, well, what difference would that make? Okay, there'd be less evil in the world if the devil's influence was withdrawn. Can we agree with that? Mm -hmm. But would there be evil in the world? Yes. Yeah, because we'd still be there. So, Jesus answered the question, though. His answer in the end of the question was, Get thee hence, Satan, verse 10, For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. And so His answer is, You can only worship God. You can't worship the devil. Only worship only worship God Himself. Now, I accidentally turned my microphone off. Uh, then the Bible says, The devil leaveth in him, him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So, when Jesus was ministered unto, obviously He was brought, he was brought sustenance. He was taken care of. Who sent the angels? God did. Yeah. So, who was providing for Jesus while He was in the wilderness for 40 days with nothing to eat? Well, God was, right? And here, guys, I just want to get as simple and as practical as I possibly can from this passage of Scripture. The reason Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Holy Ghost, the reason Jesus was taken to that place was to go through something that men have to go through, and that was God's will. Why was Jesus then, why was He empowered, why was He indwelt, by the Spirit of God when He was God Himself? Well, the simple answer is He laid aside His power as God. But the second part of the answer is what Jesus said when He said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. In other words, He was being an example for us on how to live. How aware of the ministry of God's Spirit do you suppose Jesus was while he walked on this earth and dwelt by the Spirit. Do you remember when Jesus had done miracles and he cast out devils and they said, he, he's, he's got the devil in him. He's using the, the power of Beelzebub. Remember that? You remember Jesus' response? He's casting out devils in the name of the devil. He said, you know what? Every, in any sin you sin can be forgiven but a blaspheming the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, Jesus said, I didn't cast out the devil with my power. I cast out the devils by the power of the Holy Spirit. How aware was Jesus of the work of the Holy Spirit, of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Him? I would say it, was, it would have been the very height of awareness. And then Christian, if Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, for our example, how in tune, how aware of the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit of God are you and I be then? The last thing Jesus said to His disciples before He ascended into heaven was it's not for you... Remember this? To know the seasons or the, the times which the Father hath placed in His power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Christians, I fear that there's too little of an awareness, not only of the example of Christ, but there's too little of an awareness on a personal level of God's Spirit, the ministry of God's Spirit in our lives. And that's almost universally true, isn't it? It's almost true of all of us. You want to ask the question, how can you and I overcome temptation? How can you and I follow God? How can you and I accomplish the purpose that God has called us to accomplish? And the answer is by His Spirit. By His Spirit. I could quote Scripture after Scripture after Scripture to support that this morning, but my friend, this context, this text, stands alone, and we don't need more than that, do we? So then how should we apply it? Well, first way we could apply it this morning would be simply this. If you don't have the Spirit of God in you, it's because you're not His. You may be here this morning and you may be aware of spiritual things. You may be religious. But if you've never been born again, God's Spirit is not in you. When you read what a person is, or how a person is described as being born again, 1 John chapter 5 just simply says you've got the Spirit of God in you. 
He that believeth hath the witness in himself. He that believeth hath not the witness because why? Well, he hath not believed. So, the first area of application this morning would be if God's Spirit isn't in you, it's because you've never believed. God's Spirit's real. Same as the real Spirit that descended on Jesus, God's Spirit coming in our life. My friend, it's not fake, it's not phony, it's real. Is God's Spirit in you? It's the first question. Secondly, how aware are you? How aware are you? You say, Pastor, I'm struggling with sin. Well, my friend, probably you're not following the Spirit then. Wouldn't that be true? I, 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 I have trouble overcoming temptation in my life. Well, my friend Jesus' example of being Spirit-filled is one we're not following then. And that's the practical application of the message here this morning. And I think more important and more the point of the text, once you agree, than all the things we could talk about, all the doctrines that we could discuss, of the things that Jesus was told in His dialogue between Himself and the devil. The point of it is that Jesus overcame by the power of the Spirit, and so can you and I. Father, I pray that You would increase this truth in our minds and help it to sink in all the way to our hearts, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We're going to have an invitation this morning. I think everyone here is aware how the invitation goes. So if you take your blue hymn books and open up to page 381, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you'll know that. God's Spirit will show you. This morning it could be that in your heart God's Spirit is saying, you're not my child. You're not my child. And you are under conviction. You're bothered about it. My friend, the invitation will be a time for you to receive Jesus as your Savior. Uh, we've got folks that are here that could help you. Uh, but right where you're sitting at, right in your seat, if you understand the Gospel, you know that Jesus, uh, that you're a sinner, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and that God says that whosoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know enough, actually, to receive Jesus as your Savior. You could simply, uh, right, where you're, right where you're sitting or standing, say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died for my sins, and I'm asking you to save me. I want to be born again. And my friend, God will save you for the asking. He doesn't save you because you've said a magic prayer or done some uh, great deed. God saves you because you asked to be born again. If you ask, and the Bible says that, that uh, whosoever believeth hath a witness in himself. If you believe in Jesus, God's Spirit will come in you. That's the application for you if you're lost here this morning. If you're lost, God's Spirit's telling you so. You're, you're uncertain, you're bothered, you're troubled about it. Uh, won't you be saved this morning? And then the second thing this morning is, won't you be led by God's Spirit once you follow the example of Jesus Christ? Pretty simple, pretty simple invitation. As you stand and as we uh, begin to sing page 381 as you're all on the altar, maybe maybe it would be better, maybe you'd feel more comfortable. Go ahead and stand if you, if you will, please, if you're physically able to. Maybe you'd be, feel more comfortable pausing, bowing your head, doing business with God, or putting something on the altar that you need, know needs to be there as you're all on the altar, page 381 this morning.